So today's podcast, I'm talking with Indre Biscontis about music in the mind. She's an expert on both music and neuroscience. She has a PhD in neuroscience from UCLA. She spent some time uh, as an opera, professional opera singer, and she grew up, I gather, in a family that uh, was interested in music. And maybe she can talk about that. But the main part, she's currently associate professor of psychology at the University of San Francisco, and she's on the faculty at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, she's got her hands in a lot of other things. She's the host of the Inquiring Minds podcast, which I've watched some of those podcasts. They're really interesting, and that's been going on for quite a few years, 10 years, I guess now. And then she wrote a book on how music can make you better. Um, and you can find that easily on the websites. Okay, so I looked at your wiki page. And you. so your your parents are from Lithuania. Yeah. But you were born in Canada or were you born in Lithuania? Yeah, no. So my parents, uh, my parents were born in Lithuania, and then during the Second World War, they had to run for their lives. Uh, and so my mom spent her early years grew up in Germany. Uh, I don't know where my dad went, but then eventually my dad and his family went to Venezuela. My mom and her family went to Canada, and then when they were in college, um, they met. My dad's family moved to Canada. Uh, basically, wherever you know, the country would take them, you know, is, is, is how that, well, that Canada is a good country. Canada is a good country. It may be but, better than our country these days. Well, maybe in some respects. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when I was born, uh, Lithuania was occupied by the Soviets and there was a big push to stamp out Lithuanian language and culture. Hmm. So, um, in Lithuania. And so my parents felt that we had to um, preserve it outside of the country. And so I didn't speak English until I was seven. Um, I spoke Lithuanian only at, at home. I went to Lithuanian folk dancing, Lithuanian Saturday school. Uh, you know, every, my whole life was was surrounded by Lithuanian culture. So even though I wasn't born there, it feels very much like a homeland to me. And, and it, your father was a choral conductor, is that right? No, my mom is the choral conductor. Oh, oh your dad, mom. Yeah, my mom's the choral conductor. No, my wiki dad... page is wrong, unless I... Oh, read it wrong. <laughs> well, I better go correct it. I haven't <laughs> written, it was not written by me, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, my mom's the choral conductor. My dad was an engineer. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Okay, and now you're, you are know a lot about brain engineering. <laughs> I don't know if a lot is the right characterization, but I'm interested in it for sure. Okay, I, I don't know. I looked at, of course, we, for science stuff, we go on PubMed, right? Mm -hmm. So I look back through your publications and you have really uh, interesting experience, your PhD work and work with humans recording activity from neurons with electrodes and people with epilepsy and... Uh, you know, and then doing behavioral testing too. So why don't you talk about this? Because this kind of lays a background for your subsequent studies of music and what's going on in the brain Sure. Uh, with music. Yeah, so, you know, I was always really interested in how, um, you know, in, in terms of brain behavior interactions, like what is it, can we actually see a signature in the brain of some kind of behavioral outcome? And in particular, I was interested in, how we write our own autobiography, how we build a sense of identity based on our past. And I think that probably comes from this real reverence for the past that my parents instilled in us, you know, as they had to, you know, leave their country. And so there was this whole preservation component to it. Um, so I was interested in, well, how does, how does the, like, how does the brain remember? And uh, so it turns out there's this part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is this really interesting structure um, that is, I call it, it's like very sparky because the neurons there are very quick to fire. 
Um, and that's important when you're learning something new that you have a kind of, you know, you have these these very responsive neurons um, because you never know what you're experiencing is going to have real sort of meaning or, or, you know, an emotional reaction. And so they kind of have to be primed to fire. It turns out that that is also uh, one of the reasons why this area is implicated in epilepsy, since epilepsy really is neuronal firing gone awry. Um, so there's this tight connection between especially our autobiographical memories or how we remember um, both events and facts about our lives and this area, the hippocampus. So um, even in my undergrad, uh, I, I was already studying with Morris Moscovich at, at the University of Toronto and Mary Pat McAndrews, this relationship between memory and the hippocampus and epilepsy. And so when I started my PhD, there was this opportunity at UCLA to actually record directly from these neurons in patients who are awaiting surgery. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at the time and, and still today, to a certain extent, that was really our only direct link to these cells. Everything else is correlational in terms of, you know, how we look at, at this brain region. So it was an exciting time. And so that's what I that was the electrophysiology work that I did. Um, I also did some functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then in my postdoc, I started um, moving outside of memory specifically and moving out into sort of creativity and and sort of that kind of innovative thinking and more generally. And then the postdoc was also at UCLA? No, it was at UCSF uh, with oh, Bruce yeah, Miller. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, at the memory. Oh, okay. and, and then you like San Francisco, so you... That's right, so I stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... So music, what, what is music? You know, it involves melody, harmony, um, yeah. rhythm. I mean, sure. Uh, you know, I think to me, what's really interesting is that music, I think, is a, a very subjective experience. And we can argue till the cows come home about, you know, what features of music need to be there in order for us to agree that this is in fact music as opposed to speech or other forms of organized sound. But the truth is, is that, you know, in my opinion, music is what happens when your brain tags a sound wave as music, because the same music, uh, you know, you can listen to a piece of music and not be moved by it at all, not have that same kind of reaction. And I can listen to a piece of music and have this, you know, wonderful sublime experience. Now you can also have that sublime experience, but to a different piece of music. So the question is, is it so, in the- So Andrew, then, then you're saying that you're, you're defining it as, there has to be some emotional context to what you're perceiving or is that? It has to, I mean, it has to, not even necessarily. I mean, I think that, you know, the way I define it is is how your brain responds to that sound wave. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, you know, I, and and so I think like there are, there are certain components of a sound wave that make it more likely to be interpreted as music by a more, a larger majority of brains. Um, but I, you know, I, to me, what's really magical about it is that it is this subjective, you know, experience. And so like, I'd rather look at your brain and, and see how it responds. And usually it involves a number of different networks. Um, there's your, often your, you know, empathy networks come online as you're trying to, you know, gather what, what are the intentions and the feelings and, and, you know, the, the ideas that the musicians are, are trying to espouse, um, your, uh, basal ganglia and your motor regions get involved as they perceive the beat or whatever it is that has the pulse. Um, you have motor and other sensory regions that get involved as you kind of almost, especially if you're a musician yourself, track what it would be like. Were you the one that was actually playing the music? Um, and then you have sort of this whole uh, connection between um, you know, sort of the parts of your brain that make sense of your emotional reaction and your, uh, you know, your previous knowledge and, you know, even your memory systems, uh, certain ones come online. So that to me is, is like, okay, so, so that's music. <laughs> when we can, when we see that kind of pattern of activation for that, for the, that person, they are experiencing that sound as music. And I, 
I say it that way because, um, again, I think that one of the big misconceptions, as we'll talk about, you know, later when it comes to therapeutic uses of music, is that there's something about the sound wave. And if you just play the sound wave in the right way, everybody will have the same reaction. And that's plagued music cognition researchers for decades because it's simply not true. <laughs> um, you know, and so you instead and now uh, the field actually is is in a really exciting time. We're moving towards this understanding that you don't have to keep the stimulus constant in these studies in the sense that you don't have to play the same piece of music to, you know, different people. Instead, you have to keep the physiology or the, you know, brain activation constant. And so there are tools like there's this one company I work with now called Roboto that has a machine learning algorithm that you train up. So you wear some kind of a wearable that tracks your heart rate variability as a me measure of your stress. And then you listen to a, you know, a streaming platform like Spotify for, you know, I, right now they're looking at like, it's maybe six to 12 hours over the course of say a week. Um, and the algorithm learns what features of the music are most likely to give you this physiological response, both in terms of, you know, amping you up and, you know, lowering your stress. And so then you can, you know, make the response equivalent across subjects, even while the music is different. Um, and that way, you know, so you, you can really see then how that's much more powerful than just playing the same piece of music and half your subjects don't respond to it, you know, and the other half are having this this big reaction. So with this this wearable device, then you're essentially what it's doing is kind of a readout of the relative activation of the sympathetic versus parasympathetic autonomic nervous system the sympathetics like exactly when you're in a stressful situation sympathetic ramps up when you're relaxed or parasympathetic and interestingly there's so and this is a lot of people it's kind of counterintuitive initially when i explain to them what heart rate variability is but it's the variation in the time interval between individual beats in a person. So for example, if my heart rate was 60 beats per minute, that doesn't mean I have it exactly one beat every second. Mm -hmm. It could be like 1.2, 0 0.8. Actually, a lot of heart rate, high heart rate variability is a good thing. Mm. And, and the reason is apparently is because it indicates your cardiovascular system is, it's more adapted to variation and stress and exercise is a really good example if you exercise regularly you'll have a high heart rate variability and that's because there's more parasympathetic tone you usually have a lower resting heart rate right so yeah. anyway, i'm kind of yeah no that's oh, right that's right yeah i mean i i you know i just yeah i i, I don't i i'm not an expert on the heart rate variability except to, to know that it is this measure of the relative activation of these systems and yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I think, to, to, I think that's where the kind of the future of the, what is music question is going is like, what is music to you? Yeah. Um, but we can talk about, I mean, there are some universals, the major universal across all genres and cultures seems to be repetition. That's a big component of it. Um, there is some music that explicitly avoids repetition. Um, but for a lot of people, it's actually not doesn't sound like music. <laughs> it sounds more like an abstract art. Um, but, you know, so repetition is very common. Um, and then, you know, there are these like, you know, people think that there are these equivalencies. Like, for example, there was this one idea that that everybody would hear octaves as equivalent, right? So, you know, these tones that, you know, if you, if you look at the piano um, and you play an A, you know, no matter where you play it, it has a kind of equivalency. You sort of hear it as the same. Well, it turns out there are some uh, people in South America who have not been exposed to Western music who don't hear these kinds of equivalencies. <laughs> and so it's not the same for them. Um, so I feel like every time, you know, a, a music cognition re researcher puts, you know, a stake down in the ground and says, here's a universal, someone else finds a group of people for whom that is not true. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. So for most people, especially Western ears, there are a couple of components. There's a beat um, that, you know, that we often hear or a pulse 
um, which is sort of like the and you know the 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 beat in the music, the rhythm, um, and then the rhythm comes around the pulse. So you kind of hear this 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 pulse and. Um, and then there's obviously the melody, which is the ups and downs and the contour uh, of the pitches. Um, for some people, harmony is also really important. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, how these pitches kind of gather together and uh, form a structure. But out of all of this, I think comes an understanding that there are some regularities in music. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and so the more exposed you are to a particular genre, like, say, jazz, the more you will intuitively know what those expectations are and those regularities are. And then it's really exciting when you have a jazz musician who starts to bend and go around those rules and regularities. So it doesn't seem like it's totally out of left field. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, there's a sound that's completely unexpected, but these like, you know, slight variations, um, you know, and what you expect is really exciting. And when we look at the brain signature, what we see essentially is that when you're listening to music that you know you're you're enjoying we see this anticipation of you know some kind of a a, a climax or change or or release and so we see like dopamine levels um which is this you know neurochemical involved in reward but also motivation and also movement increase in parts of the reward pathway that anticipate an outcome like the caudate and then when you actually get this sense of pleasure, some people like the beat drops or there's a climax or, you know, the Hotel California, the wailing of the guitar, um, you know, comes out in the guitar solo. You see this boost of dopamine, in the nu nucleus accumbens, which, you know, is often thought as like the pleasure center. So it kind of gives you this. So so what that is to say is that, you know, it really uh, gives credence to, you know, um, like James Taylor, who said music is just tension and release, right? It's building up the tension, building up the ex anticipation, and then a release. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, so that's what music is. <laughs> and so there's been a lot of work doing functional brain imaging in, while people are listening to music. What about when someone who's a trained musician um is you know playing. whatever i mean you you can't take anything metal in the in the mri right <laughs> yeah you can't but yeah but you can do eeg work which a lot of people do um mm -hmm. although motion is often a, a challenge with eeg um but wow. my uh friend and colleague charles Lim, who's a jazz pianist actually uh built a little midi piano keyboard that you can take into the scanner and he's done a number of studies of improvisation and um, and also singing, uh, people singing in the scanner um, to see what's happening. And, you know, what you see essentially, and th yeah, there have been lots of studies of also of classical pianists um, when they're in the scanner playing with these kinds of um, hooked up uh, keyboards. And basically what you see is that um, there, of course, are the motor regions that are engaged. Um, and then depending on what the person is doing, whether they're improvising or playing from memory, uh, you see different patterns of brain activation. So when, I think probably one of the coolest findings is that, um, this comes from Charles Lim, is that when you're improvising in jazz um, and soloing, you actually see a deactivation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So this is, you know, the part of the brain that is your kind of CEO, which like kind of most of us think of like our deliberate thinking is driven by DLPFC. And instead you see this uh, activation of more of these sensory regions and then the orbitofrontal, sort of the more emotional parts of the um, frontal cortex. And so, there's this, and, and when you see classical pianists who don't have a lot of experience improvising, you see them working their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex really hard to kind of like figure out what to do. Yeah. But as they become more comfortable with improvisation, again, you see this deactivation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie Soul by Pixar. Um, it's it's no. about a jazz, anyway, it's about a jazz musician and they totally get it right because they describe that when he's improvising, he goes somewhere else, like his consciousness goes into this nether world. And I think that's exactly what it feels like uh, for a lot of these great jazz musicians. I mean, you can see it on stage that they are not, they are not there in the same way that they would be if they were, you know. Yeah. Um. So. And. So say a guitar player, I mean, they can, you know, imagine in their mind that they're 
they're playing a song, right? And they, mm -hmm. you know, they'll they're remembering the finger they, without even moving. Yeah. So have there been studies like that where they say, you know, play your song in their mind and then compare the brain activity with that to when they're actually doing it? And I guess there's. Well, yeah, and and you know it's it there's there's a remarkable amount of overlap. Yeah, right. Um, people are actually very good at that, and you can get better at it. You know, some of the one of the things that I I teach a course at the Conservatory of Music in San Francisco, um, which is about using neuroscience to develop more effective practice strategies, um, because we have this problem amongst conservatory students where they over practice. You know, they sit in the practice room for twelve hours a day. And anyone who's studied motor learning and skill development knows that there's diminishing returns after a while. Like you just, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to better outcomes. This whole 10,000 hours rule is really misinterpreted by a lot of people that, oh, I just got to sit and put in the hours. But the truth is, is that you have to, you know, you have deliberate practice does, you know, you just can't do it for 12 hours a day. And so a lot of these students get injured over time because, you know, they're doing the same things and then they get tired and they keep doing it. So what I you mean I, they get physically injured? They get physically injured. Yeah, ah, they they get yeah. you know dystonias in their hands, or they get you know uh, they yeah they they get injuries. Like forty percent uh, of conservatory students, by some counts, have some kind of injury, which is really problematic. Carpal tunnel syndrome or something. Like exactly, that. exact some version of that. You yeah. know, tied to the what they're doing with their instrument. Um, but uh, so what I what I try to train them to do is to do more visualization work, um, especially, you know, before yeah. a concert or, you know, when they're commuting, you know, they don't need to be sitting at the piano, they can or at their instrument, they can actually very actively visualize. And in, 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 in the beginning, a lot of students find it difficult and they just think like, well, I just can't I can't imagine it. And so there are these strategies that you can teach them to get better at it. Um, and this is exactly what athletes do too. Their yeah. coaches train yeah. them to visualize. Yeah. Um, so it is very powerful. And of course, you know, yeah, we see, we see the brains look remarkably similar. You know, the other thing I will say is that when you see like brain activity in a, a pianist listening to another pianist playing a piece, what you see is a lot of um, mirroring of that activity. So not mirror neurons, but mirroring, like there's like a lot of overlap between the brains of a person playing who, you know, and, and, and the brain of the person listening, if they have that, you know, if they're, if they're the same instrument, I think I mentioned that earlier, but it's, you know, see those brain maps side by side. It really is remarkable to see how closely overlapping a listener can be. Now you mentioned the basal ganglia and you know, for a long time, it was thought the basal ganglia doesn't really have anything to do with learning and memory. It's just mm -hmm. like part of the motor system. Mm -hmm. And now we know it's it's like critical for what I guess we can call habitual memory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, essentially learning something and being able to do it without actually concentrating or thinking about it. And then also the cerebellum, surprisingly, mm -hmm. is involved now. And and when someone's improvising, my guess, edu my ed semi-educated guess would be that when they're improvising, there's maybe less activity in these brain regions involved in habitual memory. I, I don't know. Is that known? Yeah. I mean, that's right. That's right. I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, I, I don't, it's. When you when you look at the um, fMRI studies of of uh, these conditions, the problem is is that you're subtracting one from the other, right? So yeah. the basal ganglia is likely active both when you're improvising and when you're you know yeah. remembering, but it's certainly not more active when you're improvising, right? So that that's what we see. But but I think you know it is it is involved. I think there are still a lot of these learned skills, um, you know, these motor sequences that the basal ganglia you know is responsible for that come out when you're improvising. Yeah. Um, it's just not more so, you know, the cerebellum, I think is the same thing. So if we think of the cerebellum as really being about like fine motor discrimination and timing, um, you know, you would expect it would play a very big role in, uh, in, in music performance. And it likely does. The problem is, is that when we're doing neuroimaging, it probably <laughs> washes out as we subtract one condition from another. Yeah. Um, so it, we don't it comes it down well. to, to a quantitative thing and yeah, the, the spatial resolution of Functional MRI is 
I mean, you're not getting down to like the level you were doing when you're recording with electrodes in That's the brain right. where you're actually recording activity of one or maybe a group of a handful of neurons. So there's probably a lot of interesting things going on at, at more of a refined level amongst the neurons there. And with, you know, there's different neurotransmitters. You mentioned dopamine, but actually glutamate is the most mm -hmm prominent neurotransmitter, about 90% of the neurons in the, throughout the brain. So probably when you're looking at functional MRI, it's probably a readout of the glutamatergic neurons activity. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. But because we do use, you know, the subtraction method and on a lot of these studies, you don't see that. I mean, there are some people who are doing more kind of network based um um, work, but, but yeah, I mean, we don't, you know, uh, you're absolutely right that like, you know, we, we focus on in these kinds of studies on dopamine, but also on endorphins and even oxytocin, which are all implicated in music because we can track levels going up and down. Whereas glutamate, you know, it's going <laughs> to blow out the signal every time. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's, let me see. I, I, I wrote jotted some things down here. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, does the kind of music matter in terms of the, you mentioned jazz, but uh, you know, maybe just like a drum, drum solo versus uh, something more complicated in terms of what's happening in the brain? Is is there less activation of pathways by, say, drumming versus something a little more complicated? I mean, if you just take the average listener, then sure. The the and we we can actually see there's this wonderful video um, in a paper by Chapin et al. Um, I think it was a plus one paper where you can and they have these supplemental materials where they they um they show these tempo and dynamic fluctuations in um a brain as the person is listening to a piece of music a, a piece actually by chopin pianist and it was chopin chapin anyway it's easy to get confused but the composer is chopin the first author is chapin or chapin and what and and so when you watch this video uh you can actually see the brain activation get sort of hotter as the music ramps up and then it kind of you know falls down again. So that is certainly true um, that we see, you know, the brain activation does follow. And we see this also in terms of other measures of brain fun function, like brain waves, like the extent to which we see, you know, activation in these different band frequency bands. Um, we see synchronization of the of these large oscillations, these large groups of neurons firing to the pulse of the music. Um, and in fact, the more musical training you have, the better that synchronization lines up. Um, but the truth is, is that, again, I think the subjective nature comes into play. If you have a great drummer listening to another drum solo, like they're probably going to be really lit up. And yeah. if you play, you know, so I think that it's it's like, you know, we we extract the meaning from the sound depending on our experience and our passion. OK, so so far we haven't even talked about language. And, you know, I'm I'm kind of a lyrics person mm -hmm. and I listen to a lot. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. And so I listen to a lot of, you know, Bob Dylan stuff. And uh, uh, so if someone's listening to someone sing versus someone play a guitar, is there, again, a lot of overlap? and yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, singing uh, for for a lot of people, and again, not everyone. There, there are going to be people who are going to write in and say, "Well, that's not true for me. I prefer <laughs> instrumental, right?" But like for a, for a lot of people, for, for you know, uh, singing really does add a whole other layer because there's the semantic side. You know, it does activate the language networks, and especially the semantic language networks in that case. Um, but even when you see uh, musicians improvise, and this is more work by Charles Lim, um, when when jazz musicians are trading fours, that is, they you know one musician plays four bars and then the other musician responds. It's kind of a call and response okay. called trading fours. It's a it's a it's a jazz standard exercise. What you see are networks of the syntactic language system activate. So as if it's like they're they're 
it's grammatical the work that they're doing mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily semantic so we certainly see there's a lot of overlap in terms of the language networks and the music networks um, but there are also places where um where they don't overlap and so there are distinct you can see distinct um you know neural neural uh, activations and I mean, maybe this gets us into the evolutionary question, uh, you know, that yeah. you might be interested in, um, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I think the evidence or at least the logic um, really supports this idea that, that, that music as we, if you define it as, you know, sort of this brain's response to this super stimulus um, has been around for as long as we've been able to make sounds. Um, if you look at the uh, fossil record, for example, you see flutes made out of bones that are 40,000 years old. I mean, that's as old as any other human artifact that we have. Um, and when you think about what was happening, you know, once our ancestors discovered fire and they're sitting around <laughs> the campfire, I mean, chances are they were exchanging vocalizations and they were using their bodies as as percussion. And, you know, that to me seems um, highly likely. And 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 dancing and dancing and moving around. And, yeah. you know, if you think, you know, music and that's where sort of the the um, oxytocin bonding attachment story comes in, where it is a very uh, uh, potent a bonding signal like you know you we people feel very close to other people who share the same musical experience and we know that you know it triggers this attachment hormone which you know is not it has its own history of being misrepresented but um but you know so so there is that side to it um and if you think about like you know one of my uh friends nick germanico's had this great example where you know you have three primitive humans who need to move a big rock how do they synchronize their action they go huh 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 <laughs> right well there's the beginning of music <laughs> um so you know so so i think evolutionarily i don't i don't know that you can find a time where some component of music uh wouldn't have been present we even see that in how we teach our children, uh, you know, about the world and how to talk, right? We sing to them, even if it's, you know, well before we speak to them, even if we're speaking to them, but, you know, it's the, yeah. it's the pitch of that's the melody of the, of the, um, you know, the, the speech that the, that the infants are really responding to, not the words. They don't, they don't yeah. know what the words mean, but they know they learn the emotional content of the melody of the prosody of the language very early on. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned to you before I started the podcast that, and that I think this was like the early 70s, like 1970, 71, there was this show where they dressed up chimpanzees and there was like this mm -hmm. detective thing and it was, they'd actually get in little cars and drive them and ride, ride little motorcycles and, but they had a band that's called the Evolution Revolution and I'm going to, I'm going to show this clip of it. Let's see. I've got to share my screen. I think. Um, okay. So are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Here we go. Oh boy. <laughs> Lancelot Link and the Evolution Revolution. <laughs> wow.
<laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if it's funny too, like, yeah, I don't think that a video like that could get made today. <laughs> given the because of the, the animal rights people, you mean? Yeah. But I mean, it's fascinating to watch, you know, we, it's so easy to anthropomorphize the joy we see in their faces. I mean, they do look like a rock band. Um, uh, I, I think the question, so, I mean, I, I don't know if you you have like thoughts of where you want to take that, but. Uh, well, I'm just wondering, um, you know, did, are there studies in non-human primates looking at music and whether, so for example, you can do brain imaging. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can do brain imaging. I think they can, they train uh, non-human primates to lay in the magnet and look like a head and then have them listen to music and see if there's overlap and then the other thing would be you know can can they keep do they can they keep a beat mm -hmm. so those are all really great questions and we do have some answers for you um i'll start with the uh with the imaging do they do they hear music the same way that we do and would their brains respond well, there's a lot of work being done showing that, of course, what their auditory frequency uh, processing is does not overlap with ours. I don't know to what extent it's been done on non-human primates, but certainly um, there's, a, there's a, a musician named David Tai who has written music specifically for cats, for example, um, and other animals in their frequency band. So it doesn't sound like music to us, but if you, again, define music as a reaction, you know, as, as you know, it, it depends on the brain that's listening to it. Um, he's composed these, these, these uh, albums of sounds that the cats really do seem to have a music-like reaction to the way that we do. They kind of get obsessed about it. He's done it for cats. He's done, it, I think there's some birds, uh, maybe uh, and so, so that's the kind of the frequency envelope, I think has to, we have to make it equivalent for that species, um, because of course they won't. So hmm. one thing that they've, what they've shown is that for some of these non-human primates, and it's not chimpanzees, I think it might be like uh, bonobos or macaques or an another, um, uh, another species, they, they actually... Um, they hear things much more quickly. So uh, so the tempo has to be sped up a lot for them to sort of, you know, hear it. And so like, and and the equivalent where they, if they trade vocalizations and it sounds, you know, it's like also in the realm of singing, you have to slow it down for us to actually hear all the nuances in, in what they're saying. So, so that's one kind of challenge in doing this kind of work is cross species work. You, you know, mm -hmm. are you, are you going to create a music like stimulus that is species specific, or are you going to try to see whether they respond to human like music? If it comes to sort of human like music, then the, this comes to the second part of your question, which is, can they actually syn synchronize or can they feel the beat? You, there's a lot of videos of animals moving rhythmically, right? Um, but do they actually change their rhythm when the beat changes? So, you know, when there's an outside stimulus. And so we know there are all lots of these motor programs, you know, even in, instilled in, in animals when they're born, uh, that's, you know, instinctual, where they will move in a rhythmic fashion. But there are actually very few species that can synchronize to a beat uh, external stimulus. One set of species are birds that are called vocal learners. Uh, so not all birds are vocal learners. Some birds just, you know, repeat a sound that, you know, is, is in their kind of DNA. And then there are birds um, like songbirds, for example, who learn to sing original songs, right? And so their brains are actually quite different. There's a whole circuitry that's different that's evolved this ability to essentially make original sounds. Um, and vocal learning species can uh, synchronize to a beat. So they can, it does seem like they can dance uh, to music. Uh, elephants, it's a question mark, but possibly. Um, and certain primates, again, I think it's a little bit of a question mark. But the idea is that these highly social species that synchronize their movements in response to an outside stimulus are good candidates um, for being able to synchronize to the beat. And that really comes back to this question of why do we have music? I think it really is about we started living in these larger social groups. We had to learn to get along. And music is a lubricant of social activity. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I had, so let's talk about uh, two other things before we finish up. So one is music therapy. I had a, a colleague of mine, scientist at National Institute on Aging where I was, and he has a daughter that has brittle bone disease mm. where you know she, she's had, I don't know how many broken bones. And now she's, uh, I don't know, maybe 24 or something. But anyway, she music was really important for her to, you know, because she had to deal with all these issues, a lot of pain and mm -hmm. and stress. And then she um, became a music therapist. Mm. She, she's doing music therapy now up in Minnesota, I think. Um, can you talk about this? Is it's, there's a lot of studies now on music therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, well-designed controlled studies showing benefits for people with a lot of different problems. It could be Parkinson's disease. It could be something else. Do you want to talk about that? And and you're yeah. working, are they working, doing a lot of this at the music conservatory? Uh, I mean, I would love to talk about this. Um, I'm the director of communications for something called the Sound Health Network, which is a uh, a collaboration between the National Endowment for the Arts and UCSF and the National Institutes of Health and the Kennedy Center and Renee Fleming. And um, there's this whole push to really understand the impact of music on health and well-being, both to, you know, increase the quality of the research that's coming out and the funding for it. That's where the NIH comes in, um, but also public awareness of what's available. And you know, kind of the way that I, I like to talk about this is that for a lot of people, and we kind of mentioned this at the beginning, um, music is like a sledgehammer. It's just like one thing. Um, but when it comes to therapy, music really is a Swiss army knife. So you need the right tool for the right, uh, you know, uh, condition. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of a, a difference between music-based interventions that don't involve an, a therapist and music therapy specifically. And it sounds like um, you know, your colleague's daughter started out with a music based intervention when she recognized that listening to music could help reduce pain and um, and stress. And there's a lot of great evidence to suggest that that's the case. Um, I will say one of the key uh, components there is that the person pick the music <laughs> that, again, it has to be you know specific to that person. But there's there's lots of evidence, you know, starting from babies in the NICU uh, who are born premature and if they are sung to they actually put on weight faster and leave the NICU more quickly I mean these like are measurable things to people who are awaiting surgery Claudius Conrad on the east coast does some of this work where he's a surgeon and he you know ensures that his patients listen to music before surgery they need to use less sedative and the outcomes are better mm -hmm. um, so if you walk into surgery with you know more relaxation less stress it's actually really helpful and music is a great tool to get you there and then there are patients who have very painful conditions like sickle cell disease um, who also use music in that way and then there's music therapy uh, which is taking a, a music-based intervention and um, really having a therapist uh, who has worked and, and done, you know, or, or, or it has trained in a particularly evidence-based approach uh, to how to use that particular therapeutic intervention. And the reason the therapist is, is really important in a lot of these cases is that just like a psychotherapist, they need to adjust the intervention depending on what's happening that day. So imagine, you know, a music therapist will work one on one or in a small group with with individuals, and they have to be able to um, both know, you know, how the intervention works and when what to do, um, but also be able to adjust in the moment, uh, you know, within their toolkit if you know as things go. So um, there are a lot of different. Uh, very effective music therapies. Um, and so, you know, again, it depends, like, as you mentioned, Parkinson's disease, also for patients who have aphasia, who have um, damage to their language networks and can't produce language. There's a really effective form of music therapy called melodic intonation therapy, which takes advantage of the fact that sometimes people who can't speak can still sing. So they actually train them to sing the phrases that are important. Um, like I, I watched, the bathroom. <laughs> Andrew, right. I watched a couple of videos of yours, and I think this was when one of your videos, um, they had a piece on Gabby Giffords. Exactly. 
Is that what you're talking That's about? Exactly right. So she's a great example of someone who has successfully used melodic intonation therapy after a lot of work with a therapist. It's one on one work, you know, it took her years to get to where she is now, where she can give mm -hmm. speeches in public, but she still uses the tools of melodic intonation therapy. So there's this one great video, I think, from the PBS NewsHour, which actually shows the music therapist talking about how there's this one phrase that in her speech this past summer, she couldn't get out. It was, I put one foot in front of the other. And, you know, that's, that is a tough word to say, but she found a song and they sang the song, they learned the song. And then you can, you can watch Gabby actually give the speech and you can see that when she gets to that phrase, I put one foot in front of the other, she sings it with the rhythm, <laughs> but it doesn't, if you, you wouldn't know it if you yeah. didn't know, you know, beforehand. But that, you know, so that's the kind of really intensive one-on-one -on -one work that a music therapist uh, is equipped to do. And it's so effective, Mark, that we even see literally a thickening of the white matter tract, of the, of the um, nerve fibers that join these two regions that um, on the left side of the brain is, is for most of us very important. It, it joins Wernicke's area, which is our language comprehension area to Broca's area, which is speech production. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. And it, so it, it, it essentially is this highway between what you, you know, comprehend and how you respond. And in these patients, we see a thickening on the right because the left is damaged um, with melodic intonation therapy. So it's literally rewiring you yeah. know, and and taking advantage of neuroplasticity to, you know, change that brain into. Um, so anyways, I think it's really powerful. And there's been an explosion of, of evidence. And then there's quite a bit of evidence from <clears throat> structural brain imaging where you can ma measure the size of, say, the hippocampus or even yep. smaller regions. And trained musicians have some actual, their brain, the structure is changing. You can see it at a really kind of a gross level, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you absolutely can. And it's not just, I mean, think you'd think that, okay, so like the motor regions that represent the hand and pianists are going to be, you know, bigger. That seems like, you know, that that's that, that seems really obvious, but you're exactly right that there are these, these other parts of the brain um, that also seem to show volume increases with musical training. And it's, it's a, there's a dose response curve where, you know, the more training you have, the more volume you see in these different regions. So that's why some people say, you know, um, the musician's brain is a model of neuroplasticity um, because there's all these measurable ways in which we can see that the training changes it. I have, uh, so my wife and I got ukuleles a while ago mm -hmm. and we kind of, her more than me, you know, tried to learn some things and then we stopped. Uh, but I should start. I even got an amp for it. <laughs> oh, oh, great, great. I, I like loud music, so. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, loud ukulele, but there might be a limit to how loud you <laughs> want <the> ukulele. <laughs> uh, okay, last thing. The incorporation of science into the performing arts. Um, one of my, the first podcasts I did was with Nikki Clayton, who's mm. done a lot of work on uh, birds, yeah, bird, bird brain, right. you know, showing they can use tools and sh yeah. showing they're smart, but she's uh, a dancer mm. and she has this separate, she's at Cambridge, I think in England. And so she has this, I can't remember the name of it. I put it on the, in the description thing to the podcast, but, um, and you're doing this kind of thing too, right? That, mm -hmm. that the, a music conservatory, but I think this is really good incorporating science and arts and it, if nothing else, it gets performing artists interested in science and vice versa. And that's bound to foster kind of new important advances. Yeah, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, but it's strange, like a neuroscientist who's on faculty at the conservatory, but the, but the musicians are hungry for evidence-based strategies that will make them better, you know, at what they do. I mean, that's exactly what science does, right? It takes yeah. the mystery, I mean, not the, not the awe, not the magic out of what we're doing, but rather, 
you know, it, there's a lot less trial and error when you know that a particular, you know, intervention or approach works. And so they're really hungry for this. And also, you know, we live in a time where I think a lot of members of society feel like the arts are nice to have, but not need to have. Um, but if you can mm. show with science that, in fact, it's not only nice to have, it has these, you know, measurable impacts and effects, and it's part of our evolutionary history, you know, then I think you can make the argument for funding for the arts um, as being sort of really something that is worth the investment. Um, one argument that I make, I wrote this white paper called Music for Every Child, which outlines kind of all the benefits that musical training has on a child's education, you know, from, you know, all, all these gains and benefits. And it's not it's not Pollyanna-ish. I mean, it, it really shows that for, for a lot of students who are already coming in with a lot of resources, um, you know, adding music lessons in the school doesn't have as big an impact. But the impact is seen in the schools where, you know, the attendance is really problematic, where a lot of kids don't come to school uh, mm -hmm. because they have, you know, other responsibilities or, or, or other distractions. And when you put a, an effective music teacher in a school like that, the kids show up. And yeah. so you increase attendance. So the school gets more money because there's more kids in the seats. And if the kids come to school, they'll stay for math, you know, if they come for band. And then if you keep one of those kids out of prison and off the streets, that pays for 10 years of a music teacher's salary. So that's, you know, that's, I, a, that's a really important point that, that, you know, someone on lower socioeconomic status, the parents don't have money to, spend on music lessons and they you know may not even have money to buy an instrument certainly not a piano which piano you know really yeah expensive. or uh, the time to take the kid yeah. i mean even if the lessons are free you still need to truck them over there and you know take the time to take them there no, i agree there needs to be uh you know i think it's a really good use of taxpayer money um and i know a lot of you know performing art like I think the the Baltimore Symphony had mm -hmm. I can't rem remember what, what the recent status but they were you're essentially going to have to quit. Mm. Um yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you know, yeah, so I think that that's kind of that that's sort of the um what I will say is that, you know, a lot of this work now, especially, you know, bridging arts and science, et cetera, I think it really it's like, you know, the, the it lifts all boats. And I think it, you know, it trickles down in a way that a lot of other kinds of, um, you know, uh, approaches might not. And um, but I, I, I agree. I think there's an appetite amongst artists to sort of understand the science. I mean, you know, artists and scientists are not that different. We become passionate about something yeah. <laughs> and we devote all our time to it. And, you know, at the expense of our social lives, our, you know, our health, everything, right? We're, we get really passionate. And so um, so there's often a lot to talk about when you put a scientist and an artist into the room. Yeah. Okay, this is a good place to end. I've enjoyed talking to you. Sorry to get you up so early on the West Coast this morning. Uh, <laughs> no, it's been yeah. my pleasure. I'll try to keep in touch with the uh, neuroscience of music, which I I know more about since I read up on what you're doing and other things going on. And I'll Excellent. put some links to a lot of the things we talked about in addition to a few like recent review articles for people. So anyone who plays the instrument or you know has had musical background, I think will be very interested in this the science of what's going on, they're probably unaware of uh, of how much has been, been done and is being done. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say one last thing is that if you look at a graph of the, you know, publications in this area, especially music and mental health, um, you see like a, a little bit over the, you know, last 70 years and then in the last five years, this exponential increase. So it's a really exciting time. Yeah, good, <laughs> well, yeah. So you're in exciting times. I'm retired, but <laughs> and, <laughs> and only doing podcasts and writing a few books. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty nice life. <laughs> okay, Andre. Good to talk. Thanks, to you. Mark. Yeah. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.